Hey there, welcome. My name is Lou Diamond, speaker, consultant, podcaster, and author of Speakeasy. You know, in the original Speakeasies, it was real important to stay very quiet so the police couldn't hear where your clandestine special nightclub was. Well, here at this Speakeasy, we encourage conversations. You see, I believe that every connection begins with a great conversation. In fact, at this establishment and in my book, Speak Easy, I put together the tips, tricks, techniques, blends, mixtures, and concoctions that you need to make more of your conversations great. Whether you're a professional looking to grow your business, a leader looking to connect your people, or an individual looking to grow your own personal connections, the lessons you'll learn in Speak Easy will help you connect, engage, and win in all of your conversations. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that Lou Diamond didn't exist. Would you like to learn from those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level? Best-selling author of Speak Easy and master connector Lou Diamond is here to connect you to some of the most inspiring and amazing people on this planet. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome, everyone, to another spectacular episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Okay, get ready for this intro, listeners, because we have an entrepreneur, speaker, and best-selling author. This incredible individual has also blurred the lines between art and commerce. He has been an award-winning advertising writer and creative director. He's the founder and CEO of Church and State. He's the host and executive producer of the hit podcast, the, is it The Coup or The Coop? I think it's the, the coup. coup. The coup. The like coup. we're taking things over. He wrote a play, wrote for TV, produced a documentary film, created a brand art, branded art gallery, published a comedy book. He has even produced and hosted an award-winning comedy TV show. His best-selling book, Think, Do, Say, How to Seize Attention and Build Trust in a Busy, Busy World, is what we are going to be diving into a little bit today because we're going to mix it up in our continuing series of this Speak Easy mashup series. Thrive Loud listeners, I bring you the amazing Ron Tight. Ron, how are you today? Lou, thank you for that lovely introduction. Oh, that was really Hello, good. Hello, listeners. Uh, for those those listeners, you get to hear two fun people. Uh, for those watching on our Sizzle Reel video, uh, the memo was cleared. Two gentlemen wearing black collared shirts was <laughs> given right. the idea that we have her. Ron, thank you for coming on today. I wanted to do something really uh, quick. We want to bring our listeners up to speed onto the version of what's going on with Ron right now. And here's what I want to do. Let's do like the, the mini rewind. I don't want to go all the way back to the womb. I want to go back to when the idea hits you about writing, think, do, say. Well, I was uh, asked to appear on a TV show, um, like on a morning talk show kind of thing to talk about personal branding. And I started, you know, I kept on having these um they asked what I was going to talk about and a framework for what I was going to talk about. And I kept coming back with stuff. And the producer kept saying, look, these, these are not marketers. We need to, we need to really simplify, simplify, simplify. And I just blurted out <laughs> out of frustration. I was just like, look at marketing. This is marketing. Okay. This is branding. This is marketing. It is all just based on what you think, what you do and what you say. You just need to align those three things. And then she was like, hmm, that's interesting. And then I just started going granular on it and go, and go like, well, that's, that sounds okay, but what does that really mean? And I dug in deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I started the speech first because I'm a, I'm a writer, but I'm, I'm also like a speaker who I like to kind of like to talk about ideas and refine them verbally and then go, okay, I got it. Now I'm going to go away. I'm going to put my writer hat on. I'm going to kind of perfect it and write that for, the kind of the of that media so that was really where it kind of yeah and and michael port and amy port um who are true love them brilliant yeah. people um we were looking at kind of redesigning redeveloping the speech and i said well i did this thing on this tv show <laughs> i was like think do say and they're like yes that's it so it was all those forces coming together 
you do a lot of things and you you hit upon a lot of key topics in in the world that you've been in and helping to better understand how to message and market themselves. Uh, getting attention today is harder than ever. Mm -hmm. How can people rise above the clutter and and get to the point and clear the path so that they can get to their intended target? It's that is the biggest challenge that's before us, really, is kind of winning this battle for time. And, you know, the metaphor that kind of makes sense for a lot of people is, look, it's like we're all standing in the middle of Times Square and uh, which we think is amazing and has been designed for those eyeballs on the street. But the reality is you've actually got two different parts of Times Square. And the first part is the top part, which is all these messages kind of competing for time. And they're all slick and they're beautiful and they're amazing but the average consumer has no idea where to look. And then down below, you've got this other kind of entrepreneurial level of people who are um, kind of coming at you in completely different ways. And there's some stuff down there that you don't trust, right? There's a guy selling knocked off t-shirts and fake Gucci's, but you've also got some interesting boutiques down there. And, and in our world, people are down on street level attempting to win our time, not through traditional marketing message, but by disrupt, disrupting the behaviors of those big legacy businesses that exist up top. So that's why the, you know, this idea of explainer videos is so popular because there's all these new models coming in that have to first win our attention by saying, here's how it works. So all those things we're competing against. Um, and how do we win it? Well, it's not the way most people think, which is you got to cut through the clutter. So you got to do something crazy. Now, you know, if it was just, solely about winning the battle for time, then strip down and go naked. I mean, you'll get some eyeballs <laughs> or go out and kick a puppy. Just kick a puppy. You'll get attention, right? Well, that's that's not what you want to do. It's not solely about winning attention and time and cutting through. It is about doing that and simultaneously building trust yeah. into you know what you sell. And so to do that, that really is about aligning you know, first having a, a fundamental belief that goes beyond the thing you sell, of what you think, then actually delivering it uh, and kind of behaving and acting in a way that reinforces that belief. And then say it in an interesting, relevant and simple way so that people will adopt your ideas and your passions. Ron, I just want to clarify one thing before we move any further. You're telling me the the bag that I bought on the street at Times Square is not real Gucci? <laughs> That was a $600 you just flushed down the toilet. 600 I wish that was the case. Maybe that's right. in Canadian dollars. I know you guys have a whole different means of currency. Uh, by the way, this is, this is a, a big point that's happened out here. And this is a lot of what I try and help people understand is, look, we are trying to connect with people. And we're trying to do it in a very crowded space. And there's a lot of things we have to do. We got to get their attention. We got to build trust. But we also have to hit them with a point. I want to talk about having conversations in your messaging, whether mm -hmm. it's the explainer video or whether it's the content you deliver, how important is connecting through that conversation and the message that you try to deliver? Because that's actually what's happening, whether it's visual and what we see, whether it's what we're hearing from, from a certain take or even something we read in a marketing piece, it's we're trying to have a conversation with the potential consumer. Yeah, it's, and it's such a great way to put it. It's not only a conversation, but the tone, it's the tone of a conversational. It is conversational. And that's the part that a lot of marketers get wrong. That's a lot that a lot of leaders get wrong. You know, that if, if a leader stands before their people and they read a script and it's been written by their comms team, their internal communications team, to the average person, to the average employee, that, that's auto-tune, man. That's, it just, it sounds a little bit too perfect, doesn't it? I mean, it's just scripted so beautifully. It's got the appropriate level of jargon and buzzwords in there. And the reality is people smell that shit two miles away. They just do. They know that script. They've heard that script. They've heard those buzzwords. So whether it's you delivering a message verbally in person or whether it's you communicating through, you know, through copy or, or email or pitches or presentations, whatever it is, it has to be conversational. It has to be authentic and real and, and communicate like a person, not like a bot or not like some, you know, a communications person who is um, running their script by legal 
and legal is sucking out all the personality. So that's really, really critical. And why it's critical is because one, how you communicate and converse establishes trust right out, right out of the gate. So if it's like, you know, it's like when you get those sales calls, you're like two words in, you're like, oh, I know where this is going. This is a pitch slap. That's all this is. They're just pitching me and you tune out com completely. You know, there's there's this belief that, you know, within the pre-roll world, that skip ad button, it, that doesn't just exist in pre-roll. That exists in real life. <laughs> it exists in conversation where people are like, ah, how do I get, how do I get, out? how do I, where's the, and they're, they're counting down, right? Five, four, three, two, one. Can I get, hit the button to get out of this conversation now? So it's really communicating in the conversational tone. Yeah. And, and I, and I love this by the way, in, in I, I, your, your book was actually inspiring into me on helping understand the way people think from a messaging point of view as somebody who's always working with marketers and salespeople to figure out how to, how to get your message more clearly. And it also translates in another way. And that has to do with how we're leading today. And this is a big issue. The, the, the lessons of think do say hit home in how leaders are speaking to their people. Cause you're right. We smell that bullshit a mile away, our, our BS detectors are on full alert when corporate communication, when legal communication is hitting us in that way. And to really come from in here takes a lot of work and, and, and really is a lot of prep as you're going into that messaging. It, do you ever think when you're communicating, like, am I going to say something that's going to sound like it's coming from here or is it going to come from some other place of something else? I think I'd love to hear how, when you communicate, how you message what you do. Yeah, I think the first thing is to understand that we're we're all guilty of it. We all we we come to this, you know, we pick up on on buzzwords or or jargon or phrases that are kind of overused. And I think the the what's more important than not using them and exclusively avoiding them is to know when we are and to point it out. You know, I pick a phrase like it is what it is, and or. Uh, you know, our people are our most valuable resource. I think you have to be able, when you build trust as you go, and I know everybody is saying that. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll say that people should speak authentically. And I go, and I know, I know you probably think authenticity is a $2 word because everybody's using it. And there's a reason everybody's using it is because it's true. It's important. So if you address it, directly to say, I know what you're thinking, you know, and I spent a lot of time as a, as I was 20 years as a stand-up comedian and comedians will do this where they kind of break, it's called breaking the fourth wall, right? Where you go from the performer and you now start to have a conversation that takes you outside of your own performance. Jim Gaffigan does this beautifully where he'll do a bit and then he, he adopts a voice of the audience. So he'll say a joke and then he'll go, why is he saying the joke that way? <laughs> and so he's addressing the voice, literally the voice of the audience member. And I think as when we're communicating to people, we always have to be thinking of that. What are they getting from this message right now? And if they're thinking something that I don't want them to think, I address it right out of the gate. I, I love this. And uh, it, it's really funny because there's a hard line here, right? There's there's also a lot of components in the way we try to message um, from a marketing point of view that has a sales communication of externally what we do. And then there's that internal message of what we need to say importantly that's inside. Merge that all together when we bring those two instances. You, let's say you're going to work with another organization. They've been messaging a certain way. They communicate internally the leading and now they're talking to the client. Yeah. And now we got to siphon through this thing to say what's the real deal. Mm -hmm. And a, lo a lot of what, what I've been focusing on in conversations just like this is, first of all, getting real, real fast, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's so important to your point, addressing that. I love the Jim Gaffigan. I've seen him do that. Where you're like, what is he saying? But <laughs> yeah. that's so valuable because what that's doing is, is it's, it's basically addressing the 800 pound gorilla in the room. It's like the awkwardness or the uniqueness of that and making sure we highlight it is actually what makes it authentic in the moment. Yeah. Okay, now I know what we're dealing with. You agree? Yeah, a hundred percent. I have this little thing that I'll do. I'm, um, no, I think I was on time for you, for you today, but, um, he was <laughs> listeners. He actually was, this is <laughs> okay, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> but I am notoriously two to three minutes late because of something. And instead of going into the scripted, like, I'm sorry, everybody for being tardy with blah, blah. 
I'll just show up and go, is this a 1206 meeting? This is the 1206 <laughs> meeting, right? Okay, good. I'm on time. And <laughs> so I'm calling out. I know I'm late. You know I'm late. I'm apologizing in an interesting way, but I'm totally just being direct about it. And that it's it's almost like an announcement of, oh, this guy's real. Okay, he's you know not going to try and sell me something yeah. and make up an excuse. I was, I love this. I saw a comedian on stage. Uh, this was a few years back uh, at the, I'll give the shout out. It was at the Gotham Comedy Club. Yeah. And Jerry Seinfeld was getting queued up for several months later before he did his residence at, um, in New York City, where he did a whole bunch of comedy stuff. At and the Bleecker was, Theater. Yeah. At the, at, which was amazing. But yeah. what he, what he did at Gotham was he was testing out his stuff months before. Mm -hmm. a buddy of mine calls me up. He's like, I got it in. If you want to go into Gotham, there's going to be a surprise guest. Sure enough, here comes Jerry Seinfeld, does a 17 minute set. The guy that had to follow Jerry Seinfeld right. comes on. And by the way, Seinfeld was was OK. And he knew he was like literally throwing out jokes. He had like a book. He was trying the jokes out on yeah. us and what was working, what wasn't, which was cool. But he's also Jerry Seinfeld, so he could still yeah. pull it off pretty well. He finishes. The other guy comes on and he sits there and he's like, hello. And then just a long, long pause. He goes, so I have to follow Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> and he set the tone right away for, for establishing a connection of exactly what he was feeling, something really funny, but that was really like caught the moment for what was exactly there. No different than your 1206 attendance for meeting for the rest yeah. of the listeners. He got here at exactly 1159. So he was good. Um, my point and, and is that component of addressing it right away is what I call it. Like, hey, deal with it right away. That's one of yeah. the things we talk about in Speak Easy is, hey, if there's a problem situation or an awkward moment, capture it, hit it. There's a sign. There's, a, there, there's an interesting, I think, uh, in that it's such a great, the Seinfeld example is such a great example because you're transitioning. That guy needs, the, he needs a segue from what they've just seen. So there's a rule in comedy uh, that we use called uh, never ignore the reality of the room. And that's the way you do it. So if somebody, if you're doing a set and somebody yells out, you suck, everybody heard it. Everybody heard it. And so you need to deal with it right there and then remind people you're the one with the microphone. Um, and so you can't ignore that reality. And when you're going from one state, that's your Seinfeld state, to a new state, you need to segue there. And you need to call out the feeling of the room. And there's such a great trust there when, people when when you identify i know i'm not jerry seinfeld you didn't come to see me i totally get that and there's two ways to do it one is to address it directly the other way is to kind of kind of take it into some exaggerated zone in a humorous way while being completely um genuine about your own role so like he could have said please give a warm you know a big thank you to my opening act <laughs> jerry seinfeld that been good that would have been right? good by the way yeah but if he does that with a face of like, I know, and you know, like, yeah, totally like, does that just happen? What? That just happened. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, great. And, and it's no different. This happened earlier this year with uh, Chris Rock when he showed up two nights after the Oscars. So how was your weekend? Uh yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. And that's yeah. all you need is one line to get you into the new desired state. I want to talk about the state of think, do, say for you. Obviously, this came out a few years ago. It is, it's on a lot of shelves. It's on the one behind me. It's, it's in a lot of different places and it's spectacular. Uh, I ask authors on this program this question often. I want to know where this one goes. There was always a gift for the reader when you created the book. There was an excellent end game that they were going to benefit from. However, in most cases, almost every author I've ever interviewed, there was a happy accident that was a gift for you. What was the gift for Ron Tite in Think, Do, Say? The revenue? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> um, no, that, that Best because answer like ever. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from the money, what was the other big surprise? <laughs> uh, there was a big surprise is, and how to say this without sounding like an uh, arrogant jerk. Um, I think... There was more meat on the bone than I thought. And I okay. thought there was, it was like, it was like, oh, this is a nice way to package up some thoughts. This, this idea of think, do, say. And then we started applying it inside our agency. And the, I'll be honest, the line I will tell, you know, what I'll say to clients or prospects is 
because often they've read the book or they've seen the speech. And I'll say the book and the speech are the corporate theater version of this operating system. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, they are written that way and performed that way because that's what they exist in that world. But this gets really, really granular and really specific and really strategic. And so, and so in doing that, I realized like, oh, there's a lot of meat on the bone that I didn't get into in the book or that I get into in speeches because they're just not, it's not appropriate for that. But, and then we took it out of that. And then I started to see the application from a leadership perspective and from a sales perspective. And so it flipped over to say like, oh, this is an operating system. It's actually an operating system and it can be a brand operating system if you're a marketer and it can be a leadership operating system for inside uh, organizations. And then where it was really tested was in the pandemic because the, my first reaction when the pandemic was hit was I got to throw all my shit out. I got all these examples of airlines and hotels. <laughs> I can't use those. <laughs> and so as I started to formulate thoughts around what should leaders do during this time, I focused on content first. And I went back to that to go, well, the operating system doesn't change. If it's an operating system, the inputs change, the outputs change, but the operating system shouldn't. Yeah. And so that was a big surprise. That, oh, I can use this in a variety of different ways and go back to that so that I always have a roadmap. Yeah. And in, in the pandemic, it was really just about like, well, if the purpose, the thing shouldn't change. But the actions to reinforce that certainly do based on outside forces. And then how are we talking about it given this, the, you know, the environment that we're in? So that was a really happy, happy surprise. Yeah. And, and by the way, I love that example of the operating system. And I was just thinking about all the different successful speakers we've had who've come on this program, who've had books like that. And I'm just thinking now about those that we've run through this speakeasy mashup series here uh, from Leslie M, from Phil M. Jones to to a lot of other people who have, that's exactly what happened. Yes, <laughs> exactly what happened. Um, and it's really important because I think you're you're you've hit this this key message. I love that that delineation. This is what you see on stage or what you see in the book. And when we work with you, there's so much more. And and yeah. I think and I think it's great because then you can make it specific and customized. And they recognize, oh my God, this is how we can apply all of these great things into what we do every day that's valuable yeah. that's that's the i like that story yeah slight tangent do you know that i met leslie M when i was 17 years old that was the first time we've been friends Ooh. for that long were you guys like dating then no um <laughs> her mom and uncle owned a camp that i went to when i was 17 this is so it was a summer camp thing summer was, camp it was yeah it's a summer camp all right i like that yeah. who, who knew wow i know i, I know did she, did she have swagger back then oh yeah. she's had swagger she's never yeah, not had it. i think i asked she, her yeah, that no, question 100 hundred percent within that. I love asking guests on this program, this question, Ron, I want to see where this goes. Look, you've been thriving in your career from being a comic on stage to being a key marketer to church and state, which we didn't even talk about here. We'll get to it in a little bit, um, which means on most days you're thriving, but we all have those days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. Ron tight. When you have trouble thriving, what practice do you seek? Or maybe which individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? Heroin. I knew it. I knew it. Who's your dealer? <laughs> Leslie M. <laughs> Let's not tell her that. Um, other than her. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the listeners. Let's just keep this between us, okay? That's yes. not just, hey, yeah, listen. no tweeting that out. Remember the guy on, on Times Square that he met? That wasn't a salesman <laughs> yeah. for Gucci. <laughs> What's trending on Twitter is Leslie M is Ron Tide's heroin dealer. Okay, great. Amazing. That's awesome. Spectacular. Liquidation sale. I, you know what I need? Um, I, it's depending what it is, right? Because sometimes it's a, it's an efficiency funk, like, oh, I'm just not getting anything done. Or sometimes it's a creative funk where I, oh, my writing sucks right now. Or sometimes it's an inspiration funk um, of just, I'm not getting inspired. And what I do is I turn it off. Oh. You know, I think you bang your head against the wall and you're like, why isn't this working? You know what? Go to YouTube and search out random shit and just consume stuff that takes you in a completely different zone. And that's the stuff that will inspire new ideas. It's, you know, like um, I had this great idea, um, uh, this this idea that um, the only thing worse than the great resignation is the great resignation. And that in that 
yes, the great resignation, as we've talked about it for this past couple of years, is that um, it is a reaction to an unfavorable situation. This sucks. I quit. I'm out of here. But the other definition of resignation, there's two, def two definitions of resignation. And the other one is when you're simply resigned. Yeah. That you, you, you don't, you don't, you're not inspired to do something new. You're just doing the same old thing over and over and over again. Now, where did, and I think that's an interesting business insight about something that's really popular. How did I think of that? I watched Bo Burnham. <laughs> I love Bo. And I watched Bo Burnham because, and it was, I didn't, again, I didn't go out like, I want to figure this out. So I'm going to watch Bo Burnham. I just randomly toggled over, like, all right, I'm seeking out random stuff. And when I, started to dig into the uh his make happy and inside i was like how did he reinvent himself in this inside how did he do that like it's such a brilliant piece and then i backtracked it and followed it i'm like oh he went from the great resignation to the great resignation and realizing that he had to reinvent himself mm. and how he approached his comedy and that I was like boom I hammer out a blog post or like a LinkedIn post about that. Design a slide right away. Like that moment, I design a slide with Bo Burnham on it. I stick it into a bucket and I promise myself the next speech I give, I'm going to use it. I'm going to test it out. And then Alison Levine, who is a great friend and yeah. a wonderful, brilliant speaker, lovely she, human she, being. She has been on Thrive Loud. We love Alison. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Alison was with me in um, San Antonio and I used it for the first time. And I said, did you, like, did you, do you know? And she didn't know who Bo Burnham was. And I said, oh, you didn't know, like, I, does it, does it make sense? Even though you don't know who he is. And she said, uh, did it make sense? I went back to my room and geeked out on him because I loved your example of that. So it's, you toggle over, just watch random stuff and be inspired. That's a good way to do it. I'm like, everyone's got their own thing. You're, you're, yeah. you're perfect and watching good comedy. Do you do that a lot? Do you watch a lot of good comedy? Is that like a thing? Like, you know, like Not catching on YouTube or? Yeah, yeah. In some ways, I don't. Yeah, I'll randomly do it. See what kind of comes up in various algorithms. Um, but it takes a lot for me to sit down and watch a two-hour special because yeah. I'm typically like, oh, I know what they're doing. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Um, but uh, hence like, the reason you just described the reason why we try to make these podcasts 30 minutes long. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. We have short attention span theater for what we can take in those moments and the way that people watch stuff now. It's like, it's the, it's the one minute hit that hits you, which is getting now back to heroin. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> it all comes full circle. Let's do the admin part of the show. Then we're going to have an extended version of fun street with you, Ron, Ron, sure. share with the listeners, all the places people can find you, learn about you, learn about church and state, all that stuff. We'll put it in the show notes, but it gets more engagement when they hear it from you. It's just Ron tight everywhere. It's just Ron tight.com. It's Ron tight on LinkedIn. It's Ron tight uh, on the Instagram and everywhere else. Um, and then uh, church and state is just church state.com. That was the easiest logistics people driving are already typing it in and that's t-i-t-e for those who need it but they'll see it on the show notes which is all good thank you all right so we're going to do a fun street and then we're going to do one last thing between speakeasy and think do say okay awesome. this is this is how we go i'm going to ask you a question here this is about since you're you're you love to watch movies and stuff like that do you like movies i do yeah yeah is there one particular movie that you could rewatch over and over again uh the usual suspects uh and why does that movie connect so much with you uh, the ending blows me away every time. The performances are absolutely brilliant. And I love the the core. I don't know if you know this about the movie. And this doesn't really give anything away for those who haven't seen it. Although it's been like 25 years. Like, I think it, <laughs> you might, know, be, it might be that. 30 years. but keep, Yeah, keep 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, when they wrote that, they the, the writer and the director were at a Sundance. And somebody said to them, what's your next movie about? And the writer said, our next movie is about five guilty criminals who meet in the same police lineup. That's it. They had that statement. And when they talk, when they went back and started talking about that, everybody told them that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. You never have five guilty criminals in the same police lineup. It's one guilty person and four right. innocent schlubs. And I love the Brian Singer said, all I need to do is create a story that gets me there. Mm, and I great. think that's such a great philosophical thing 
for all of us, which is like you have some ridiculous destination, just build the story that gets you there. Like what needs to happen for you to land in a police lineup with four other guilty people? So I love that core element to it. Um, and um, I don't know, just the character of Kaiser Sose is that's yeah, incredible. I want to say that I've worked with at least three or four people who like, whether it was their social handle or some derivative of it was either Kobayashi or Kaiser Sose. Either <laughs> one of them had interjected those terms into their lives. I used to think that that's who it really was at one point. Or another. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to do the speed round here of Fun Street with Ron Tight. You're going to love this. I'm going to ask you something. I want the first thing that comes to your mind. These are things that lift you up, motivate you, make you feel good. They basically make you thrive. Amazing. You're ready. Okay. Of late, a song that you've been listening to or one that pumps you up. Um, that Elton John, uh, Dua Lupa, uh, That's Dua, good one. Um, the, yeah, it's like the mishmash one. It's, which it's a mashup. It's a mashup. And I, I and the reason, because my kids love it. And mm -hmm. I like, this is one of those like, yeah, I can dig this song. Yeah. I think it bring, brings all the new together. Yeah. Favorite food that is not a dessert. Oh, I would say nachos. Ooh. Favorite dessert. Ooh, uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Big fan too there. An activity you wish you did more of? Running. Activity you wish you did less of? Uh, hmm. Consume Diet Coke. <laughs> if I could snap my fingers and Ron Tite could be anywhere in the world, where is he? At home with my wife and children. Oh, very nice. She's, or she's Amsterdam. Or Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> with heroin okay yeah, we believe yeah. supplied by leslie m okay <laughs> um one last piece here messages that you have heard or feedback that made you actually feel good in here as it related to your work of think do say whether it was the speech you gave or whether it was the book you delivered or even the work you did with clients something that your work connected with them in such a way that it really hit home here this, I, I'll give you an example that um, I, it may not be as speedy, but the I was doing a speech for a very large organization and um, someone came up to me and she said, hey, I saw you speak five years ago. And I go, oh, that's, uh, that, that, you know, what was, and she said, just so you know, I do two, probably 200 pitch decks a year because it was a media organization. I, I do pitch decks for, for media agencies. And just so you know, over the past five years, in every single one of those pitch decks, the opening page is a quote from you. Oh, wow. And I was like, what? And I said, what, what's the quote? And she said, um, oh, it's when I saw you, you said, we have to create things that people want to see, not things they have to see. And... Um, and I did, you know, it's, it was, it was, I was, I was, I was humbled. I was touched. I was amazing. But I thought it was such great insight for all of us, for all of those listeners, for all writers, which is we have impact on, we have, there are people who are, who have heard things we've said, or they've read things we've written, and it is deeply impacting their lives. And they'll, you'll never know. You'll never know. And so I, I, in our friends at page two, yeah. Um, I wrote a story for their Christmas get together where I talked about the fact that um, there was a guy named Gordon Corman who wrote a book when he was 13 years old. And he inspired me to write a piece when I was, I think 12 or 13. Cause I thought if this guy can do it, I can do it. And, and then, you know, all these years later, I became an author of two books and stuff. And I told the authors of page two that, Hey, this guy had this profound effect on my life and he doesn't even know I exist. And then immediately after that, I thought he should. And mm. I wrote him and I told him. L listeners and viewers need to know, uh, obviously both Think Do Say and Speak Easy is a page two production. We're both from that house. And I will tell you that among the many reasons that um, I, I ended up working with page two was Think Do Say. Uh, because of not only its message, but its clarity, it's a pretty cool cover. And uh, the fact that it had such a respectful person that we have here on this program here today. So I was very glad to be part of this family again and uh, connect the two. Listeners, go check out both. Think, do, say, speak easy. All the links are on this episode page. 
were both amazing pieces. But more importantly, uh, Ron Tite, thank you so much for coming on Thrive Loud today. Oh, thanks for having me. And listeners, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> to all our listeners out there, thanks for joining us. And until next time, keep moving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thrivelab.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.